Thanks for coming today, folks. Uh, I've got uh, some 300 admitted candidates in a master's program in sustainability and environmental management here through Harvard's Experimental School Extension School, which uh, we started the online education programs at Harvard. Now we're dinosaurs. But if anybody's interested, you can check extension.harvard.edu slash courses and just click down to environmental studies. And we're offering uh, uh, several dozen courses, spring and fall semester, uh, that anybody can take. And if you want to get a certificate or undergrad or grad degree, then you have to go through a few other protocols. But they're open to high school kids at 50 percent scholarships, teachers at high school at 50 percent scholarships. It's a neat program. But I want to talk today about a couple of things. One is my old friend Limulus Polyphemus, the, the multi-eyed Hershey crab that in the 1970s uh, bumped into me in Pleasant Bay in Cape Cod. And, and uh, Phil Schwinn said, damn horse feet. And turns out Limulus uh, the horseshoe crab then had a bounty on it, Nicola Tail, uh, because they were thought to be uh, the world's worst predators on clams. And thanks to the work of Zach Svitas, uh, Bill Sargent, Ken Reed, uh, and a host of Earthwatch people. We helped found Earthwatch expeditions back then. Uh, I was one of the first principal investigators and chief scientists. We were able to show the horseshoe crab, in fact, was not a, a major predator. Uh, they uh, go back in the history of time young folks before us are talking about some of that history of time today uh, going back. And it turns out horseshoe crab's uh, line uh, lineage goes back hundreds of millions of years to that of the trilobites. In fact, their larvae, uh, their young egg that our uh, young speakers were talking about, the, the young of things, the, uh, the larval uh, uh, form uh, in the egg is called the, the trilobite larvae. And uh, Limulus is an interesting animal, once abundant in the world's oceans, now limited to uh, one species on the east coast of the United States from Maine to Florida, a few in the Caribbean, uh, individuals, and then off the Sea of Japan. And uh, so the, the uh, uh, over hundreds of millions of years, this survivor, this resilient organism has survived, but then it ran into trouble. Part was that bounty, which helped to demolish the population, and then more recently was the discovery uh, a couple of decades ago that its eggs were good bait for things. Having fished out inshore bait fish, uh, fishermen oftentimes would catch horse, female horseshoe crabs, which are the big ones, that carry the eggs, rip them in half, and, and use the, uh, the egg-laden part uh, as bait. And so uh, this is where uh, Bill Sargent and Ruth and Ken Reed and I, a host of uh, Earthwatch volunteers, showed up on the scene to show that Lemulus, in fact, uh, was not a major predator. During that time, in the late 70s, early 80s, Fred Bang and Stanley Watson at Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, and the Marine Biological Lab uh, figured out that the horseshoe crab blood, uh, which has copper as the oxygen-carrying pigment, bright blue, uh, not hemoglobin, was a phenomenal uh, biological substance. It agglutinated or clumped together in the presence of anything that might harm the horseshoe crab, virus, fungi, bacteria. And they then figured out that that same test uh, could be utilized uh, for tests to test human medicines to so make sure you didn't get bad medicine. Dick Foster right here at Harvard died uh, from bad, uh, bad batch of penicillin. And so the Hershey crab then became really famous, sort of as did we. People were flying down into radicals on Hershey crabs because now uh, the pressure was on to collect these animals and bleed them. In so doing, they killed them in the early days. Again, the team came back together. We showed that, in fact, the horseshoe crab, where you stick a big needle here, uh, could donate blood just as we can. Can donate up to half its blood and survive. And so then we had to learn about being a politician, an advocate, and figure out how to get the FDA to make rules, the states to make rules, the federal government to make rules, so the horseshoe crab could be harvested but not killed, its blood uh, borrowed, and then it returned to the sea. Well, like anything, People took the horseshoe crab and dumped them wherever they could. We had to go back, multi-year story here, had to go back and get the rules changed again so that you had to return the crab from the waters it was taken. They let them sit for days in trucks. We had to go back, get the rules changed again. You have to return them the day they were bled to the place they were collected. And, uh, and so this stabilized the population declines, and as a result, the horseshoe crab was able to become a lifesaver. Uh, its blood is used in every major biomedical test you know, on human medicines. IV fluid, insulin, dialysis, which turns out I was later involved in when my daughter 
had to go on dialysis before I donated a kidney to her. So we, we found that, that here's an animal. Now, where does this live, by the way? The beautiful coral reefs? Now. The tropical rainforest? Now. The dark, dank, cold waters of the east coast of the U.S. And so, although we always, you know, genuflect to the charismatic megafauna, and we look to these wonderful tropical things, here in the cold waters there may be lifesavers that we have yet to identify, that we have yet to meet. And, and so the, the story here is really, wow, all the diversity of life on Earth is phenomenal, all that we've discovered. There's more things to discover and more things to discover about those, those organisms. So now we've got the horseshoe crab stabilized and the real push came on to collect them, to bleed them. We solve that. Then the push come on to collect them to use their eggs. This has really impacted the population badly as bait fish have gone down, bait has gone down. Here's a free uh, bait. And so now we're back over the last decade trying to make sure that not too many are collected for bait. Uh, clearly collected for bait, you kill them. Unfortunately, take the bigger females. That's not good. Males don't have the eggs. That doesn't make good bait. But the horseshoe crab population today has been reduced so much that the red knot that feeds on those eggs, anybody look at birds here, any Audubon members? The red knot is a migratory bird that migrates pole to pole, depends largely on horseshoe crab eggs for the protein to load up in the spring, in May, April and May and June, when the horseshoe crab eggs are in the shallow sands. So now we see the red knot is being listed, I see a book up back about listing, is being listed as a critically threatened species because there aren't enough eggs for it to, to eat. So I've just summarized 40 years of research right there. Let's talk about the crab a bit. Look at this wonderful eye on this, thing, complex eye. It can see as well in the dark as it can uh, in, in the light. When it is just molted, and this is a, one of the larger molts, you can tell a molt, by the way, because the front is, is gently pushed in. So if you ever find one on the beach, think it's a dead horseshoe crab, if the front, this is one of the larger ones you'd find, is pushed in. Most of the uh, molts are smaller, like this one, which is several months old. And I brought a couple of extras if somebody wants to take one home there. They're a little bit fragile. If they spray them with varnish, they'll be fine. But again, uh, push down on the front. So you can always tell a, a female adult because it has little uh, straight clipper, uh, clip like uh, feet on the front. The male, as we'll see in a couple of minutes, has round hooked claws. So this eye has been studied by Barlow at Woods Hole. And, a uh, number of individuals, uh, and in fact, it was the horseshoe crab nerves that helped to uh, do, uh, be used in a lot of uh, research on, on uh, uh, nerve impulse transmission. When you dive, when you walk, you find horseshoe crabs in shallow water. You can find them in water a foot deep. If you find them at low tide, dug in the sand, leave them there. They will dig in the wet sand, uh, close their gills. They have these uh, book gills which relates them back to what animal? Any biology students here? What other animal has book gills? Some people don't like them. Spiders, yes. So they have book gills. In fact, they're closer to arachnids than true crabs. Even though we call them horseshoe crab, they're not a true crab. And they molt out the front rather than the back. And so uh, those book gills are, are one of the keys to that. So they can close those book gills when they go down in the mud, and they're perfectly fine. The rule used to be if you found one, you had to throw it up on the high, above the high tide line so it would die. And uh, we got rid of those. And here's these book gills here in this image here. You see they look just like the books of a gill. And uh, they use those to exchange gases. Uh, and they're pristine as long as sand doesn't get in them. If you pick one up to look at it, don't poke the gills. They're very, very tender. And then release the animal back into a couple of feet of water. They have wonderful spines on the back that are movable to help protect them from getting uh, bitten and uh, consumed by something. The tail here is put up, as you see in the slide, uh, to defend it. And uh, it can move that tail about. It can also use that tail to stick in the sand to help it flip over if it happens to get knocked over uh, in the waves or in the tide. And there it is successfully flipping itself over next to a flounder, next to some uh, uh, sand dollars, and so you go snorkeling or diving in shallow water here in New England. You see wonderful things, and there it is all the way over. When they mate, the smaller male, which is the width of your hand, usually at, at most, will attach onto a bigger female, which can be quite large, uh, 
formerly twice as big as this one, and hang on for dear life with those front little clippers of theirs uh, until she goes up on a beach in, in uh, late April, May, or early June to dig a little uh, depression and, and lay her tiny uh, green eggs and T-squirt sperm on them. And uh, as you can see in this slide here, these are, these are older horseshoe crabs. Why? They're covered with stuff. And, and so they're covered with algae. They're covered with barnacles. They're covered with, with uh, small uh, crepidual slipper shells. And here's a pair, newly molted pair uh, that clearly haven't got that growth. So we can, as, uh, as uh, uh, we used to have from people at Woods Hole say, take a scraper sample. Uh, you, can, you can see that here. Hogle Janusz would say, get a scraper sample off the shelf so we can look at the biology of them. They don't like being picked up. They, 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 I'm going to get out of here. So they, they tend to struggle. But here's a molt showing that little depression there in the front that's pushing. And here's a specimen molting, crawling out of its shell. Uh, it can detach itself from its own uh, exoskeleton with enzymes, crawl out, and as it does, it almost doubles in size as it comes out. So then it leaves the molt behind. Wouldn't you all like to do that? Anybody over a certain tender age with skin? <laughs> Leave it all behind and, and move on. And uh, here's a freshly uh, molted one up top. You can see down the bottom of this slide, there's the molten up top, the one almost 50% bigger that's just molted out. They'll then go into a shallow water area and uh, be quiescent, quiet for a while amongst the, the eelgrass or whatever. And uh, when they're young, they're light gray, blend in perfectly with the bottom. And as they grow, you see the first month or two of growth right here with a good shiny penny next to it. Uh, and so they're not easily seen. But if you go and crawl around in the sand, hopefully if S with SPF and, a, and some uh, insect repellent and a hat on from the sun, uh, you can find these little molts washed up uh, in, in uh, May, June, and July on the beaches up amongst the sand and then through the summer all the way up to the fall uh, when you'll see ones this big. So you, you can literally collect the first year of growth in molts uh, and we do that for studies. Uh, we don't have to go out and try to find those little guys in the, in, the, in the shallows. We just go collect molts from certain beaches where the wind has pushed them up and realize that's a rough population there. When they're, when they're attacked, they may lose a tail or grow a new tail. This is a bifurcated tail. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that scraper sample, my God, if you're doing the Lynn Margulis work, just get a horseshoe crab and do some scrapings off the back, uh, and you'll find you know, a couple of dozen variety of of marine microorganisms there, plus the crepidula snails and a, a few other things. Uh, they can't attack you. They can't bite you. They can't stab you. There's no poison. There's no toxin. Uh, people used to have you thinking that they were laying in wait in the shallow waters to do something to you. That's, that's not the case. And so here's the uh, mouth parts close up. Anybody ever have a pet uh, tarantula? There it is right there, the, the natho base. Look at that. Um, and uh, just like a tarantula, uh, back to the spider relatives shoveling food into their mouth. And there's the male, round hooked claws to grasp on to the back of the female. And you can see places here where males had actually clamped onto the back there. And so these are very interesting animals. There's a nice clean pair uh, up mating. And uh, here's John Valois, and we're down at, at Pleasant Bay there collecting them for research at, at the Marine Biological Laboratory. And in terms of biodiversity, these crabs help uh, the population by stirring up the sand, uh, by making sharp red sand grains available for larvae. Uh, and when we uh, were out there collecting them, this is from uh, the geographic article Andy Martinez did, and uh, we, we found that, that these crabs, sometimes people just like the shell. So we found the, the molts could actually be sold. A lot of artists use the molts in their artwork. Uh, our Earthwatch groups helped us uh, study them. We found that they're flatworm factories. Uh, all of you have studied Pletty Helminthes in college. Uh, if you remember Planaria, well, one of its relatives loves to live by the gills and by the joints feeding on some blood cells that come out. Uh, we had people from all over, always use plastic utensils in the field. A lot of animals, particularly worms and some inverts, don't like metal, so you get plastic tweezers. And this is horseshoe crab Saturday in Pleasant Bay, where the neighborhood kids would come help us collect them, mark them, and release them. We'd spray them on the back and, and let them go. Some famous stories early on, we used uh, pink balloons, green balloons. And my fisherman friend stopped drinking when we saw balloons going in different directions against the tide. Now we have very expensive but nice little uh, devices that are uh, digital. And uh, the, the thing is always, if you work with live animals, 
care for them very carefully so they're in as good or better shape when you uh, release them. Uh, it turns out the horseshoe crabs, uh, if anything, feed on some of the young conchs, which when they grow up are major predators of shellfish. And, uh, and so uh, sort of reverse of what happened. The uh, LAL, Limulus amoebocytic lysate, is the blood, and here we are at Stanley Watson in the back smoking there, uh, and the, one of the future shellfish people in, in, uh, in Orleans. You see the blood comes out this grayish uh, substance, uh, and in the early days, the crabs would be left on the, left on the ground to die after they were bled. But like you and I, they can donate a, a quotient of their blood, and we found if we resuscitate them in the water, uh, they can do well. And oftentimes, we'd find that once it had been bled, uh, uh, almost dry or not properly cared for, washed up dead later. And so we found resuscitating them is a good way to take care of them. This is a tube of their blood. The interesting thing about the blood is if you take a, an aliquot of it, put a little tube, shake it and blow on it, shake it and blow on it, there's enough of microorganisms in your breath to cause the blood to, to, to uh, agglutinate, to coagulate. And so what you see there is a giant proteinaceous clot at the top of that tube. And when you're done, you can sometimes unscrew the cap and hold it upside down, and it doesn't flaw it. It's clotted so well. Uh, we take good care of our animals, as I said. Valerie <laughs> knitted this one its own little mittens. And uh, so this has been part of our Pleasant Bay Ecology Project work. And so the thing is to save Limulus, the real blue blood. And uh, I hope I've given you a look into one particular uh, invertebrate that, uh, that I've studied. And uh, they're, they're pretty interesting animals. There's lots of different pretty interesting animals out there. And some of them have a bounty on them. Some are thought to be bad animals. And we need more biologists, more ecologists, more nature watchers to go out and realize this isn't the way it is. It's, it's the other way around. Just think if we hadn't got rid of that bounty. Maybe there wouldn't have been enough of these for the blood to be able to be bled to save people every single day. There's work going on to try to create an alternative molecule. There's work going on to see if you can breed them in captivity. Small piece of success, nothing to, to change the way things are. That to date, collecting the limulus and ble bleeding them gently and releasing them is the best way to get that blood, which nowadays, for the piece of the story, is that blood is now one of the number one things used when you're doing uh, cellular research because we need biologically clean glassware, not just chemically clean glassware. Uh, and they're used now as tests on batches of any uh, microcircuits or, or microchips because one bacterium can create enough of acid to destroy a microchip. And so now their blood is being used beyond the met biomedical industry and biopharma on, on into uh, biotechnology. So this is a future great field here, this biopharma. Uh, we're looking at, at a phenomenal variety of uses for, for things from the sea. The sponges that Tom Garo and Tom Garo's parents have looked at and I've looked at uh, for decades. Uh, every time we look at a sponge, we find bioactive compounds. Compounds that are anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial. And, and so the question is, before the last of some of those sponges go, are we going to be able to identify those, those chemicals and actually be able to use them in the, this, this burgeoning biopharmacological industry uh, that we've got? Uh, so uh, this great blue world of ours, the, the, the blue, uh, blue marble in space, as Jacques Cousteau called us, uh, is still there. And, and when we go around and look at the biodiversity of this planet, we see that the biodiversity uh, is still there. It's impacted. It's been badly affected. Uh, how can we save what's left? And that's up to every single person when they get up in the morning and look in the mirror. What can I do today that will lessen my impact on this earth? Uh, we used to say we'll live in caves with candles. There's too many of us and we'd pollute the heck out of the caves with the candles. So the question is, into the future, um, where, where do we go with this? Uh, so anyway, I want to thank you all, and uh, I'll be around later if there's questions. I will leave three limulus molts up here if anybody would like one.